Hello everybody, my name is Brandon. Welcome back to the channel. I am here today with my June 2020 reading wrap up. So this is going to be all of the books that I read in June. So June ended up being another very productive month for me in terms of the number of items that I was able to get through. We have uh, physical books, graphic novels, audiobooks, all sorts of things to talk about here today. So without any further ado, we have eight books to talk about. So let's dive right in. So I'm going to go through these in the order that I completed them this past month. So first up will be Halloween, written by John Passarella. And this, of course, was released in 2018 because it is the official movie novelization of the 2018 Halloween film. So if you guys have been watching the channel this year, you might recall that my most disappointing first time viewing in 2019 was Halloween from 2018. Uh, I didn't watch it when it was released that year. I had to wait until the following year and I was just disappointed with it. It was not at all what I was expecting and I just, I don't think it lived up to the hype that kind of was surrounding it before its release. So I didn't enjoy that one at all, unfortunately. So why did I read the novelization of this film then? Well, it was available on Hoopla. So that's how I did this one. I did this uh, via audiobook, thanks to Hoopla. And because it was available, I decided, you know what? Give it a shot. Maybe try the film again after you read the novelization because you'll have like a maybe a better understanding of what's going on and some of the character motiv motivations. And so that's what I did. I read the novelization and I watched the movie afterwards. So I'll talk about the movie in my media wrap up, which will be later on this week. And uh, but right now I want to talk about the novelization. So if you don't know, this is actually a sequel to the original. So this takes place 30 years after the events of the original Halloween film, Carpenter's Halloween. Halloween and everything in between. So all of those films that we may have come to love over time, none of those are canon. None of those exist. Even, you know, the original was like Halloween, Halloween 2, and then Halloween H2O. That was kind of the original canon trilogy for this. Well, now they've completely <laughs> revamped that as well. We have Halloween and then, uh, ha and then Halloween 2018. So you have the original and then this one, and that is canon to the Halloween universe, which as I've talked about before, and you can tell because I'm reading all these Star Wars books, canon really doesn't matter all that much. It's just something that a studio or a publisher decides to do. Generally speaking, it's just to, to make money. But in this case, I don't know if that, well, it probably is because then, you know, you have more people seeing it if you just have to watch the original as opposed to all of these, you know, whatever, 10 movies in between or whatever it is. So anyway, I'm rambling. But this takes place right after that. So you might remember that the relationship between Laurie and uh, the shape, Michael, was not really established until the second film. So that relationship doesn't exist in the first film and it doesn't exist here. So they do some interesting things with that. So basically we are following the story of Lori 30 years later. She is basically the estranged grandmother at this point. Uh, she has a daughter who she lost to adoption at like when she, the daughter was 11 years old. Uh, she lost to not, she had to give her up for adoption or, or whatever the case is. Like, like the state took her away uh, at when she was 11. And then, uh, you know, the, the daughter had a daughter. So now we're following the granddaughter's story. And that's really the main character of this, her and her group of friends, which is very similar to Lori and her group of, of friends in the original film. So if you know that, it might feel a little familiar to you. But what I really liked about this was just th the novelization specifically was the fact that you do get more of the motivations behind things. You get uh, just elaborate, uh, more elaborated detail than you, that you lose in the film. And I think a lot of that really helped me enjoy this a heck of a lot more than I enjoyed the film the first time I watched it. Uh, really, I, I thought this one was pretty darn good. I ended up giving this one three and a half out of five stars. I enjoyed it. Uh, I would not recommend it necessarily if you are not a fan of the original film, but if you are familiar with this Halloween franchise, I think there is something that's really interesting about this. And I didn't appreciate it the first time I watched the film, but reading this novelization, I really appreciated how it establishes this connection between Lori and the shape. Um, and frankly, between like the granddaughter and even the mother and the shape. Um, it's nothing very concrete, but it works for what the film is trying to do. Now, I do have some issues with the book. Obviously, I gave it three and a half and nothing higher, but I think it's kind of the same issues I have with the film. It's just the story itself. So while I definitely would uh, recommend the book over the movie, 
which again, I'll talk about the movie in my next wrap up. Uh, I would recommend the book over the movie though. I think the novelization kind of, uh, it does better what the movie is trying to do. So I enjoyed it. Uh, there are some issues with it, but I still ended up giving it three and a half out of five stars. And I would recommend it to fans of the Halloween franchise. Next up is another audiobook, and this one I had on Audible in my collection, and this is Hostage, written by Robert Crace. So I didn't even know this book existed until I saw it in the Audible two-for-one credit sale back in May, I believe it was. Either late May or early June, I don't remember, but uh, I didn't realize this movie even existed, or the, the, the book even existed, because I love the movie. It is one of, I think, the most underrated action films out there. I've seen it multiple times and have loved it every single time. In fact, one time I watched this movie on my uncle's broken TV. I was much younger and I was staying at his house overnight. On my, it was his broken TV and it only played in black and white. And watching this film in black and white was just so interesting after having already seen it multiple times in color. Uh, I don't, as obviously as it was intended, it is a, you know, it's not a black and white film by any stretch, but I don't know. I just, that experience alone really cemented it as one of my favorites. So I love this movie. I had no idea it was based on a book. So once I saw that the book existed, of course, I had to pick up the book. So Hostage is about a our, our main character named Jeff Talley, who, of course, is Bruce Willis in the film. And he, at the beginning of the book, is a negotiator. I think he's like part of LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department, in the beginning. Um, but he's a negotiator. And basically, he has one too many bad negotiations. And uh, the, the one we're hearing, of course, is the one that breaks the camel's back. And so he decides to leave and he takes on a role instead as like a sheriff, I believe, whatever the head officer is, I think that's a sheriff, of this small town uh, police force that's somewhere uh, in California. And uh, unfortunately for him, these three teenagers decide to rob a liquor store and then they're driving in their car stalls. They start, you know, uh, trying to figure out what they're going to do. They need to get out. They're trying to get to Mexico. And so they decide to go into this house. It happens to be like this, this really nice house. And uh, so that's what draws them near because they figure that they will have a vehicle that they can steal. Uh, unfortunately, things don't quite work out as planned and it becomes a hostage situation. And so Jeff Talley is forced back into his old role again and trying to negotiate this situation. But there's so much more than that going on here. Uh, I don't want to reveal exactly what happens if, because if, you know, I, I don't want that to be a spoiler at all because I don't remember exactly when you find out kind of what else is going on throughout the book. So I don't want to talk anymore about it, but something more than meets the eye is going on. And no, it's not Transformers and no, it's not, uh, you know, any supernatural thing or anything like that. It's, it's very, you know, uh, it's a crime film. It's a, a hostage thriller and that's exactly what it is. So I, like I said, huge fan of the film. Love it. It is remarkable how similar it is to the film, but again, how different it is to the film. So in the film, you know, our main house that we're watching is like secluded up on this giant mountain. It's just like really fancy high tech house. And it's just a significantly different setting. The, the characters, the, there is the, the husband and then two kids. Uh, one's a, a teenage girl and one is a younger boy, somewhere around nine. He's a little bit older in the book than he is in the film. And he is just a much bigger jerk and kind of a creep in the book. Uh, whereas in the film, that's not the case at all. He's a very likable little boy. Um, but, you know, I don't want to talk too much, you know, book versus movie because I don't want to, you know, waste your time with that. But um, I don't know. I just, I really love this story, the idea of this story. And I think the book executes it quite well. Um, the characters are very interesting. Uh, you get so many more characters in the book than you do in the film. Um, and that part it kind of gets a little bit more confusing, to be frank, but it is very refreshing to really kind of finally get an understanding of what in the hell is going on in the film, because there's just so much going on that, you know, even on multiple viewings, it's like, what, did I miss something? Are there deleted scenes? Like, what's going on here? You know, I'm sure it plays it out better than I'm remembering. It has been a number of years since I've seen the film, but it just felt like it explains it. And it explains it thoroughly in the book. So, uh, you know, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Yes, it, it is a little bit slower than the film, but still, I think this thing moves along quite briskly. I really enjoyed it. So I ended up giving, not the film, but the book version of Hostage, four out of five stars.
Next up was the first graphic novel I finished last month, and that is The Piper. And this is by Mike Calvoda and Alex McChain. Yeah, Alex McChain. And so this is actually from Zenescape, which is a... Where is it? Right there. Zenescape Entertainment, which is a graphic novel company that I've always been interested in. They do the grim fairy tales, which a lot of them... Like, if you look at some of the uh, alternate covers here... Let me show you some of the alternate covers real quick, if I can find them quickly. Because this is what I think of when I think of... Of, yeah, that one's maybe a little too risque, but like something like this over here. Like this is what I think of when I think Grim Fairy Tales, when I think Xenoscope, because that's what they're really known for. They have these like crazy covers. I mean, this one's probably yeah a little too risque, but um, yeah, I don't know. So that's what I think of when I think of Xenoscope. But this one was different. It didn't have that, you know, crazy cover and it sounded very interesting. And I mean, it has an introduction by the Candyman, Tony Todd, which obviously I love Candyman. So I was like, yeah, let's give this a shot. Unfortunately, the introduction is like super short and doesn't really <laughs> add anything to it. It could have been written by anybody and just had Tony Todd's name thrown on it, whatever. So anyway, the Piper. This is the story of uh, our titular Piper who like 700 years ago, he was uh, brought to this town to rid the, rid the town of uh, these rats that were basically overtaking the town. And they agreed on a price. That once he did the deed, he went to collect on his on his price and they screwed him over and only gave him like half or whatever it was of what they promised. And so, of course, this did not go well. So like that night, the piper, he left and then he comes back and he uses his pipe to hit whatever. I don't know what this is. It's a flute, I guess. He uses that to uh, summon all the children of the town to the lake and he ends up killing all the kids, which then the town kills him. So that's how he dies. So then 700 years later, we are introduced to our main character, whose name I couldn't tell you if you paid me $100 at this point. But um, our main character here, as you can see him there, he is a gifted musical student. He's very talented with his, uh, with his music playing. And so he happens to stumble upon this ancient evil and uh, is going to use it to wreak havoc on those that have done him wrong, essentially. But of course, things aren't going to go quite in the way that he anticipates. So this one was, honestly, it was kind of what I was expecting. I was not expecting too much here, but even in that, it just, it wasn't very good. I'm not a huge fan of the artwork, which I'm showing here. Um, it's okay. There are some decent, like, gore scenes, I guess, but Man, I can't even find a really interesting page to show. There we go. There's a good page. Um, so there's some interesting artwork uh, every once in a while, but it's so few and far between. Uh, the story itself, I thought, was pretty lacking. Uh, there was a joke in here that I was just like, wow, that was... He called... Like, they call the kid Columbine, which is just like, wow, that... I, I've never heard, like, Columbine used as a, an insult before, and it was quite jarring. And this was released in 2008. I don't know if I said that or not, but... So, you know, it's quite some time, uh, what, 12 years from... Uh, after Columbine happened, because I think Columbine was 96, uh, somewhere around there. So, I don't know, 10 to 12 years uh, after Columbine. So, to hear someone in high school call somebody else... It was just so strange. Um, but the reason they do that is because he did get caught bringing a gun to school uh, either a few months earlier or the year prior or whatever it is. So uh, it's definitely going on. Uh, it's definitely a story about bullying and kind of the consequences of that. It's very basic. I exactly what you kind of expect to happen as it goes on is, you know, probably be, it's probably going to be what happens. Uh, it's only four chapters. There's only four issues long. And really, there's just not much here to uh, recommend. I, I didn't connect with this one much at all. There is some issues in the back that are kind of like standalone stories that are also related to the story of the Piper. But even those were not very interesting. I read one of them and the other one I kind of skimmed through just because I didn't care. So I don't know. Unfortunately, this one did not do it for me. If you guys have read Xenoscope in the past and you know of there, that there are some grim fairy tales that are actually good, please let me know down in the comments below. I would love to give Xenoscope and the Grim Fairy Tales another shot. Unfortunately, the Piper was not for me. So I ended up giving the Piper uh, one and a half out of five stars. So the second and last novelization that I finished last month is Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. So this is episode five of the Star Wars series. This was written by Donald F. Glutt, of course, based on the screenplay by George Lucas. And this was released in 1980 to coincide with the film. So 
I probably don't need to explain what this is about because everybody knows the Star Wars uh, film franchise, if not the books, you know, the Star Wars movies. So uh, basically, this takes place a few months after the events of Episode 4. Spoilers, I guess, if you can even give spoilers for Star Wars anymore, but uh, the at least the original series. The uh, Death Star has been destroyed and the Rebels have escaped for the time being. They are now held up on Hoth. And uh, basically, this is exactly what it says. The Empire is going to strike back. So Vader goes on the offensive. He's trying to find Luke and uh, Leia and, all, and, and Han and uh, Chewbacca, R2-D2 and uh, C-3PO. All of our, our favorite friends here from the Star Wars franchise, of course, are back. And so uh, they find them on Hoth and then the uh, group tries to escape at that point. They get split up. Uh, um, this is the the uh, episode where uh, Luke is going to find Yoda. So he goes to uh, find Yoda and uh, train to be a Jedi Master. Um, we also get introduced to Lando Calrissian, I guess is how you would say that, uh, in this one as well, which I think is a really great character. I don't, I just, I, man. I love this book. I, I love this franchise. Like, it's just so fun. I want to live in the world of Star Wars. Like, it is just so much more interesting than anything we could be doing right now. So, this is written so well. I really feel like Glut spent time reading Alan Dean Foster's works, uh, you know, with Splinter of the Mind's Eye and Episode 4. And this feels like it could have been... Alan Dean, Foster, Alan Dean Foster writing it because he uses it's the same style. Um, I think this one is probably a little bit more accessible even than Foster's work. Not to say anything negative about Foster's work. I think it's wonderful. But I think this one is probably a little bit just more accessible with his writing style than maybe those other ones were. Which again, you know, we're a, a few years uh, later now than we were with the original two that I read. And so that could also play, you know, a, 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 that could also have an impact on my saying that as well. But I think Glut is fantastic. I have no idea what else he writes. I don't know if he writes any more in the Star Wars franchise or not, but I definitely want to find out more because I really enjoyed uh, his style. Um, but I honestly, I think I liked this one the best out of the three Star Wars books that I've read so far. And uh, the the next one uh, has a episode six has a lot to live up to because it's so far, it's so great. And I think I said, I think this is my favorite one. So I gave this one four and a half out of five stars. Cannot wait to get through episode six and finish the original trilogy. And then I think I'm going to jump into the Thrawn trilogy. So really excited to do that. So Star Wars, uh, The Empire Strikes Back, I gave four and a half out of five stars. Next up is another audiobook I finished last month called Cold Storage, written by David Kopp or David Kep. I'm not exactly sure how to say that last name. But this was one that was actually a deal of the day on Audible for like $2.95. So I grabbed it. And it was relatively recently. Uh, it was one that was in my wish list. And so for three bucks, I'm definitely going to pick it up. So this is basically like a bio horror book, but it's definitely more bio. So it's definitely more sci-fi than horror. Yet there is some, you know, pretty graphic descriptions that would no, you would normally see in the horror genre. So at the beginning of Cold Storage, the Pentagon sends these three bioterrorist uh, operatives to this city because they fear that there is a biological like warfare going on there, basically. And what they come across is this organism that is basically has apocalyptic uh, uh, possibilities because of how quickly it can mutate and take over the human body. So it is a big deal to keep it contained. So they're able to do that they basically the, the the whole town is just the havoc has already you know gone through there and so there's nothing left and so they get a sample because they have to and they store it in a like military uh sub basement and they nuke the town essentially so they get this stored away in the basement and they think everything will be fine unless all of these very specific terribly unlikely things happen well, 30 years later, all of these things, of course, have happened and it is no longer safe. So we pick up present day now and the bioterror operative, uh, one of the three, our main character, is called back into duty. He's retired, but he has to come back to basically fix this problem. And so uh, present day, we are following a secure, these two security guards. One is a single mother and the other is an ex-con. That doesn't really play too much into the story, but it's on the back of the book. So I figured I'd mention it. Um, and so these two, along with our bio uh, terror uh, operative, now have to basically save the world. 
stop this thing from getting out. And I should mention they are security guards at a uh, storage locker facility. So like a U-Haul place where all the, uh, all your storage lockers, something like that. So that's the story of cold storage. And it's a matter of, you know, will they be able to stop this or will they not? This one moves along probably slower than some people might like, just because like you're halfway through the book or more before you really, uh, before there are two main, two of our three main characters really understand what's going on. Um, it takes them a long time to just get to this basement level because obviously, you know, it's a, uh, things have changed. Like the, the layout of the building has changed and it's much more difficult to access the basement, which was done purposely. You know, it was made so that no one could access it, but uh, the security guards here are beeping and so they decide to track it down and that's how they come across this. Uh, there is just some really great characters in this and that's what really drove this story for me. I loved the the banter between the two the security guards. I thought that was really interesting. Of course, you know, there is a relationship that builds between these two and it, it feels very not natural at all, but it's very sweet and charming and I, I did enjoy that. Um, I really liked watching our, uh, our bioterror operative come out of retirement and just him dealing with uh, even just like aches and pains and his body not cooperating the way it once did when he was doing this full time. Uh, I thought that was really well done also. The, uh, the story, like I said, it takes a little bit to really get rolling, but I think the lead up to it was interesting enough for me that I enjoyed it all the way through. There are some other characters that are added in here, which they are just kind of off the wall and they're, they're very memorable because of that. Uh, and I enjoyed reading them. I thought it was just, it's a fun story, uh, which it might not sound like it based on the uh, description, but it definitely is, uh, you know, it's definitely sci-fi horror, much more sci-fi than horror, but it's also a lot of comedy mixed in. And for me, the jokes landed. I think things worked really well, but obviously comedy is so subjective. So I'll leave that up to you to decide. But uh, for me, it worked. So I really enjoyed this one. So I gave Cold Storage by David Kopp four out of five stars. Next up was The Colorado Kid, written by Stephen King. So I had high expectations for this one because it was the other book that Stephen King wrote that was released by Hard Case Crime. And so I loved Joyland, one of my faves. And so I was really hoping I was going to love Colorado Kid. And while I liked it, it was nowhere near the same <laughs> anything that the uh, that Joyland was. So uh, Colorado Kid, I read on audiobook thanks to uh, Hoopla. I borrowed it there. So this is a very short one. It's like three and a half hours on the audiobook. It's like just about 200 pages in written form. It's very short. So uh, this one is odd because it's not really... <laughs> okay, so it's basically three people sitting around and telling a story. So uh, it takes place in Maine, of course, because it's a Stephen King novel. And these two uh, editors for a newspaper, uh, like a small town newspaper, are telling their intern, they're like in their 90s, and they're telling their young intern, this girl, uh, this one story that they is not even really a story, as they say multiple times, because it, it doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end. It just kind of has events and questions. There's no resolution whatsoever. So keep that in mind before you head into this. If you're somebody that needs resolution, you're not going to get it here because that's not what this is about. But you're basically being told the story of uh, the Colorado kids. So that is a nickname they gave to this person who died on this island that they, they live on. And uh, all these, there's kind of some weird circumstances that were surrounding his death. And so they have uh, decided, or when they were younger, they decided that they were going to try to figure out what happened here. And so they spent a lot of time with this in their youth, trying to figure out who did it and why? And I guess it wasn't in their youth because I think this was only like 20 years prior or so. And they're in their 90s. So they would have been in their like 70s at that point. But um, either way, <laughs> it is them reliving their past. And uh, the uh, the younger, the intern, the younger girl is basically trying to kind of unravel the story herself as they tell it. And that's really it. Now, why this book is enjoyable is because of the characters. I'll admit, it took me a little while to really fall into the characters, but I honestly think that was more the audiobook's problem than, than Stephen King's writing. Because the audiobook, uh, the narrator, I don't remember his name, but 
overall, he did a fine job, but he uses these very thick accents on the two older gentlemen that it was very difficult to catch everything that he was saying at first. And it took me a little while to really uh, catch on to the accent so my ear could understand what was being said, uh, you know, every word. And once I caught on, I really enjoyed the characters. I think they have such a, a witty banter amongst themselves and with this younger intern and she fits in so well to this group of three it's it's really cool to see that um so i enjoyed this one but not nearly on the same level as i've enjoyed probably any other king novel i probably put it at the bottom of the list uh, i didn't really like pet cemetery all that well either but i still think it's a better story than colorado kid so i'm still giving colorado kid by stephen king three and a half out of five stars but it's definitely not one that I would recommend you run out and read. If you are a King completionist, then fortunately it's a very short one. So even if you don't love it, you'll get through it pretty quickly. So Colorado Kid, three and a half out of five stars. Next up is the last graphic novel I finished last month, and that is The Anchor, Volume 1, Five Furies. And this is written by, I believe his first name is Phil Hester, and uh, art by Trilla, but I don't remember his first name. So um, this one was actually a gift, for reference, it's Brian Trilla. Uh, but this one was actually a Christmas gift from Chris uh, last year. So thank you again, Chris. He gave me Volume 1 and Volume 2, which wraps up the story of The Anchor. So... It's very hard to tell you what this book is about. So what I'm going to do instead is kind of just read the back here. So uh, the anchor, holy warrior on holy war, freak of nature, beast of burden, medieval prize fighter, Viking raider, God's own leg breaker. 1000 years ago, a hulking outcast sought refuge in the crumbling ruins of an ancient monastery and offered in return the one thing he had to give his fists. So you might be getting Hellboy vibes here, which is very, <laughs> that's accurate. It's very Hell Hellboy vibes. Um, so basically uh, transformed into an immortal warrior monk to stand at the gates of hell itself and keep our world free from invading armies. The anchor was mysteriously tricked into centuries of slumber. But today, this holy warrior must rise again to battle all the unholy monsters unleashed during his slumber. So specifically in this book, he is fighting these five furies that whatever the devil has unleashed on him in order to try to take over the world. And uh, this one was, it, it's not a bad story by any stretch, but I didn't connect with it as much as I was hoping. Uh, the first issue, I didn't really like at all. Um, but then the middle of the story gets pretty good. And then the final issue was just kind of mediocre again. Um, and I think there's only four issues in this, if I remember. I think it's a four-issue volume, which it's not telling me offhand. But I'm pretty certain it was just four issues. So half of it I, I enjoyed. The other half I didn't. So, you know, um, basically with this is uh, the, some of the relationships here, at least, is the anchor... His, the first time he lands on uh, Earth or like present day, he meets this woman who is very interested in the uh, basically the time that he's from. And so she recognizes some things that he's wearing and, you know, gets a nickname for him and everything based on that. Uh, and he has a connection with her immediately, um, even though he is, you know, definitely there for a single minded purpose of stopping the devil's five furies. Um, but he still has a connection with them. And then there is a ghost boy that's introduced who I thought was a very charming character that I liked his addition because it added a lot to the story. But I don't know. Overall, I just didn't love this one. Um, so I'm in, I ended up giving it two and a half out of five stars. I will read volume two just because I have it and I want to finish up the story. Um, I don't know how quickly I will jump on it though. So, you know, I, I appreciate it for what it is, but it just wasn't for me. So I gave the anchor two and a half out of five stars. All right, and the final book I finished last month was Animorphs number three, The Encounter, written by K.A. Applegate. So, you know, if you are watching the channel, you'll know I have a book review up for number one and number two. Number three will be coming soon, so definitely check that out for my more uh, full thoughts when I get to that. But this one, we are following the story of Tobias, who, if you have uh, been reading or if you've read these in the past, you'll know that Tobias is the Falcon. And so this one I thought was my favorite in the Animorphs series so far. Yes, there are some problems with it that I will elaborate on when I do my full review of it. But just in general, I think this was the most interesting take because it is the most different character out of all of them. And again, with the hologram cover here, not hologram, but whatever it's called. I love this. Um, so anyway, squirrel. Um, 
uh, <laughs> what was I even saying? I don't even know. Uh, some problems with this. Yes. Um, it, you know, I think it kind of gets uh, bogged down a tiny little bit in the kind of regret of um, Tobias's actions in previous books, which I'm being extremely vague here because I don't want to give away anything if you have not read these. Um, but I don't know. I just, I loved how far uh, Applegate went with some of these things. Like there is, I mean, really it talks about love. It talks about suicide. Uh, I mean, there's just so many different layers here that I think you're getting more into as the series gets deeper that are so interesting and handled so well in a middle grade book series. I just, I really enjoyed this one. So again, my full thoughts will be available in a review, which will be available later this month. So definitely check that out if you are interested. But I ended up giving Animorphs number three, The Encounter by K.A. Applegate, four and a half out of five stars. Probably my favorite in the Animorph series so far. Really excited to move on to book number four. All right, so that's going to do it for my June 2020 book wrap-up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. My four physical books and then, of course, the four digital things that I finished this past month. So it was a really solid month for me. The graphic novels didn't really do it for me like I was hoping they would, but the novelizations I enjoyed and uh, virtually everything else I liked quite a bit. So it was a very positive reading month for me, and I'm hoping July shapes up to be the same. But I will admit there probably I will probably have less books to talk about at the end of July because I have a uh, certification that I'm studying for as well that takes place at the end of the month. So uh, who knows? I'm trying to do that and read what I want, actually want to read. So it's it's a big mess, but we'll see what July brings. So, so let me know what you guys ended up reading in the month of June. I'd love to hear about it down in the comments section below and have more of a conversation with you guys down there. As always, if you guys enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Cinefessions here on YouTube. And if not, Thank you anyway for watching. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys. So that's going to do it for today. I just want to say thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.